All right, joining us now, she was part of the one-two punch in the circle, leading UCF to an American Conference regular season championship, American Conference tournament championship, win a regional for the first time, finished the highest-ranked UCF team of all time, wins with 49 wins, 14th ranked. She was a big part of that. I speak of Kamal Woodall, who joins us. How you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good. What's it been like? Have you reflected on the season here for you? Obviously, you're one and one and done for you as UCF, which we'll get into. But uh, historic gear. What what have you had the time to think about as you've reflected on the year? Um, I think that uh, as a team and as a person, we we got to reflect a lot on the season. Um, I think you've heard a lot of us talk about just how special this team was in terms of not just how we played on the field and. Uh, what a great team we were execution wise. I think you hear a lot of us talk about what we were like chemistry wise and what we were like everywhere but the field. And uh, that was really special. It was something really magical. Uh, and so most of our reflection, most of my reflection, personal reflection has been about that and has been with people. Uh, and we've just been rem- sharing our stories, remembering the different moments, the pinnacle moments throughout season for us, um, the, all the little things that kind of made us what we were. And that's what a lot of the reflection has been about for me. And personally, as an individual, it's kind of been about reflecting on how all the roads uh, that seem to twist and turn and all the little obstacles, big obstacles that kind of got thrown at me as an athlete um, all seem to lead me here. And uh, it just was one big storybook ending to my softball career and I think a storybook um, page to UCF's um, story. Yeah, I would say so. And boy, you finished out an uh, incredible year, 18 and five with a 198 ERA, uh, all conference performer. Uh, I mean, I guess because people, you know, and it's funny, we just passed the one year anniversary of you actually uh, uh, officially joining UCF from the tribe. You, did you, did yeah. that, is that popped to your head how fast this year has gone? Oh yeah, it's it's brought, gotten brought up multiple times. I remember um, the the anniversary of Coach Bear giving me a call uh, just just passed as well. So it feels like that was a day ago, and also feels like it's been a while. So what? Uh, when I tell you those numbers and the success, I think people from the outside were would be surprised because when you agreed to come, to, you know, you see if it wasn't. Uh, a big like hoopla, if you will, it was kind of under the radar. You had a good you know career in East Carolina, but what do you think changed in this one year? Because you were incredible. Uh, you were at the top of your game, the best year of your career, I think you would agree. Uh, what was it that took you to the next level? Um, so I think my entire career, I've, I've had the tools, but what really set me up and this team up for success was two things, I think. Uh, A, it was Coach Bear and his coaching staff. I, every single one of them put in so much of their time and their love into this program and really built it into, into, into what it was so that we could perform and excel on the field. And she, like Coach Bear put that belief in me and she put that belief in our team, uh, one through 22. And so did the rest of the coaching staff. And that made a huge difference for me as a player, uh, being listened to and, kind of being guided in how to perform to the best of my ability um, as a per, as an individual, but also how to perform to the best of our ability together. And I think that that's just a coaching staff thing. It was incredible to work with every single one of them. And I think they were huge difference makers. And then B, again, just the, it is a perfect storm of uh, the people that we brought together. And again, I think that reflects on the coaching staff kind of understanding like what kind of character it takes to build a successful team. And I was able to play the best of my ability on the field because every single person behind me, in front of me, in the dugout, um, put me there. And they put their trust in me and I was able to trust them in a way that I've never been able to trust a team before. And that's not speaking down on the teams I've had before because I played with some very, very talented people every year uh but it was more than just talent that came together for us this year it was a belief and a trust and a kind of um 
coercive unit that I've never been able to experience. And I think that is personally what helped me excel, but also what helped us excel as a team. Describe that, you know, what's it like that bullpen session with Coach Bear? What, what, what is that like? Uh, early on, it was us getting to know each other. So all she knew me as was pretty, just a feisty, like gritty pitcher who's going to just try and get you out no matter how many pitches I have to throw. Uh, but in my head, I know I'm someone I, I want to, as an individual, I want to strike people out. I want to get swings and misses. I want to dominate. I don't want to just get by. And so a lot of our first bullpen sessions were, were me explaining that to her, like, hey, I'm not just feisty. I like to think and uh, I like to work my way through batters and just as a team dominate the opponent. And I think she liked that in me. And I had so much to learn from her. I mean, we developed my pitches and like it was it was little things like changing where I put my fingers on the ball to big things like uh, my stride and what kind of drills we were doing to prepare me. Um, but early on, the bullpens looked like a lot of talking and not a lot of pitching. And then later on, it was very natural. It was just Coach Bear would have me throw and just say, what are you feeling? And we just it was just an open conversation and it was just super comfortable. It was like a little family. But you two seem to hit it off right away. Uh, is that accurate that you two hit it off? Which, you know, it's, you know, you would think, oh, it could take some time. It's something different. You, but why? Why do you think it clicked so quickly with the two of you? Because uh, she's mentioned it. Obviously, obviously, from her standpoint, it helped that she literally had to face you where you were at ECU a bunch of times. You nearly knocked off UCF uh, a couple times on that occasion. So she kind of saw already what you had from that standpoint, and, and I think she said that there were some things she thought she could tweak. But she also felt like there was things that you didn't even know you could come out of you. Uh, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Coach Bear understood me. I think me and Coach Bear are very similar pitchers in terms of mental approach and how we are as players on the field and in practice as well. So, and I don't think we realized that until, or maybe I didn't realize that until we were in the bullpen talking one time and we just, and she talked about how she was as a player, how you really couldn't get her out of the bullpen for anything. She would have thrown for hours if, she, if you let her. Um, and I mean, she described me to a T and then she would talk about how, I mean, she never wanted the ball out of her hand. She was always going to fight. She was always going to be the dog in the fight, whether or not um, anybody else would. And it just, I, I think I, I realized that. And sometimes we butt heads a little bit and it was because I think we were just incredibly similar in terms of how we did things. And so once we figured that out, she didn't have to say much to get me to do things. I think we were always on the same page. And then it was mechanics, mindset, and actually executing what we both wanted to happen. You join a staff that had Gianna Mancho, you competed against. Aaliyah White was the grad coach who you also competed with. And I think you knew her. You two knew each other because you're both from the Tampa area. So what, what was, how was that dynamic like? Well, immediately coming in, the dynamic of the bullpen with – me, Gianna, Caitlin, Angie, Grace. It was immediately welcoming and it was immediately like we fed off of each other and we spent a lot of time together. So immediately that chemistry was awesome. Uh, Aaliyah, I've actually known since I was 14. Thir actually, no, th 12 or 13. Uh, we played against each other a lot in high school and middle school. We, played, we both played for high school teams as middle schoolers. Um, and then from then on, we had been friends for a really long time and we played travel ball together just before going to college. So me and Ali have known each other for a very long time. So it was a really nice homecoming to get to have a familiar face in the bullpen as well um, and kind of share and remember uh, how we played against each other and what that was like and rooming together in travel ball. Uh, but the dynamic, especially with me and G and then the whole pitching staff was just, it was never overly competitive. It was never... Um, I, I don't want to use the word toxic, but it was just always like, we always like fed off of each other. We were always rooting for each other and we made each other better every single day. I think what was really cool about our bullpen was that we were always aware of what, whatever, what we were all working on. They knew as soon as I was starting to develop an off speed and I was watching when she would prime her rise ball or she would work on her drop ball. I helped her with her change up and she helped me get my screwball spin. And so like, it was really awesome to like, walk into the bullpen and be like, oh, hey, how's your off speed going? Or be able to just look at someone's grip and be like, hey, you need to do this. And it was just a really positive, awesome environment to be a part of. And we really feed off, we really fed off each other well. And I think that goes to show like how confident we were on the mound. And 
you know, I'm sure being honest with each other, like you mentioned, you've known Aaliyah for a long time. That probably helped you too in that, you know, you could be honest with her. She could be honest with you, especially when she knows how everything works around there. That had to help as well. Absolutely. And there were a lot of tough, I, there was a lot of awesome moments this season and they were a product of a lot of the tough moments we had early on. And I worked through some adversity. This team worked through some adversity early on and Aaliyah was there to kind of, me and Aaliyah are also pretty similar competitors. We both want to be perfect every time and to and to put our team in the best uh, possible scenario to win every single time. And that's just not possible. We're not machines. And so I'd come into the bullpen, face red, angry, and Leah kind of knew what to say to get me to come back to earth and be ready to throw the next pitch, the next inning. So what got you interested in getting into softball? You mentioned from the Tampa area. What was it? And was and I'm always fascinated because I, I think I've told you this. I feel like you were built to be a UCF Knight. Your personality, the way, your passion, like – a lot of the night fans really grew to, you know, get hooked on you because I think in a lot of ways you represented what they, you know, the UCF fan base is like. So I'm curious as what got you into softball and was UCF ever in the picture way back when you were kind of thinking about going to college? Yeah. So what got me into softball, like initially, like what got me into playing, uh, I was a cheerleader uh and I love to cheer and my coach I had just moved to a new town so my parents immediately just got me into cheer is the most natural thing to do and then my cheerleading coach quit in the middle of season um and the first thing that was there the next like couple weekends at that park was softball signups and I remember I cried and begged my dad not to do it uh, I don't I didn't want to do it and I was a very shy introverted person and he signed me up anyway and he forced me to do it and that's history. Um, I loved it. I just, the game is, and this team, this softball team in particular, UCFs, reminded me why I loved it so much and why I kept going back when things got so hard. But um, yeah, that's what got me into softball. And then UCF, I I, when I was younger, I really looked into, I got recruited at 14. That's when I decided where I was going to go for college. So at that point, the schools on my radar were, um, I had based my, what I wanted around the coaching staff. And also I was super, in, um, I, I looked into a lot of what schools were coming to my showcases. So specifically the schools, schools on my showcases were a lot of Southeast um, schools and I think I was looking out of state just in general. Um, and UCF, I heard a little bit about, but I was, I had my eyes set elsewhere pretty early on. So it was hard to sway me away from the schools that I had kind of, I saw a lot of them, they were in my face a lot and they got on my list and that's where I focused on. So I think UCF left my radar pretty early just because they weren't on that initial like list of schools that I, I really went hard for. You end up going to NC State uh, yeah. there for the first couple of years. There was a coaching change, which is what led you to enter uh, to transfer, correct? Yes. Take me through that. What was that like? Difficult? Yeah. So my freshman year at NC State was actually pretty, pretty good. I played a lot as a freshman. I had an injury, which was tough, but we – I had an awesome um, – had an awesome – yeah, treatment staff there, a pretty good team environment, and the initial coaching there was really awesome. And they um, they helped me through my injury, and they like really supported me through that. And I was expecting to play a lot next year. Uh, and then the new coaching staff came in, and I will say that I don't have much positive to say about that experience. It was pretty hard. It took a toll on me, and it made me question kind of who I was as an athlete and what I wanted out of softball. Uh, I mean, a couple of good, cool faces came out of there. Coach Wilkinson, who's over at Georgia now, was awesome. She taught me a lot as a pitcher. But other than that, it was a really tough, tough year as an athlete for me. And it made me really question if I wanted to do it anymore. And that's when the portal came into play uh, for me because the environment was so, 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 uh, I, I don't want to be too negative, but it was very toxic. And it's, uh, the best option for me was to find somewhere um, where I could thrive and that I could possibly have a chance to grow more as an athlete. And so that's when the portal came into play for me um, after my sophomore year. You end up going to East Carolina to play uh, for Coach Courtney Oliver. 
describe that experience. And then here we go. A couple of years later, coaching changed. And now you're thinking about, man, you know, what were you thinking? Cause you're like, you, you're probably part of you is probably thinking, am I, am I, you know, cursed or jinxed, you know I mean? <laughs> right. It's just kind of weird. Like the, what are the odds? Yeah, <laughs> that was, um, that was another thing that kind of passed through my head. I was like, what, why, um, why me? But I, so I actually chose ECU because coach Oliver was and the person who recruited me to NC state and she was on the support staff at NC state. She was assistant coach. And then she took the head coach position the year before I entered college. And I was a little upset about that because coach Oliver was one of those people that I like really bonded with. And I was really excited to get to work with her. So when I entered the transfer portal, uh, the quickest thing to not the quickest, but the thing that made the most sense for me to do was to head over to ECU with coach Oliver because she knew me already. She had a lot of confidence. I mean, she wanted to give me the ball and that was something that made me excited. So I went to ECU uh, COVID hits, we get one year lost. And then the next year, uh, that's when we played UCF and, um, all that happened. And then, yeah, uh, she gets, she, that, that coaching staff change transition happened. And I found myself without a coaching staff once again. Uh, but this time the transfer portal was something that people knew more about. And it was something that I understood a little bit more. And I think I had, I saw more of an opportunity instead of as something that I was kind of being forced to do because of the environment I was in. That's fascinating. So to you, the two experiences were very, were different. Absolutely. Very different. The first time I used the transfer portal, I believe it was the first year the modern transfer portal was active and everybody who transferred that year, I think it was called the year of the transfer or something. Everyone who transferred that year was using it for the first time, including coaches. So it was really strange and scary and I saw it as something like I was leaving my dream school I was leaving the school I wanted to be at after ECU and when the transfer portal came up I was like well this is my chance this is a chance for just one more year I get to kind of pick where I want to be and kind of roll the dice it was an opportunity instead of something that was very scary the second time well, and that's why I wanted to have you on here, because obviously right now, that's a big part of the college landscape right now. It's the transfer portal in college athletics. Uh, there's been some talk of maybe having some windows and trying to limit, you know, how often, you know, when you can join. A so you, you have a great perspective, because uh, I think yeah. you're a big positive of it. When What advice would you give a student athlete currently and in the next, you know, about the transfer portal? Hmm. So... I kind of wanted to weigh in on the debate a little bit because I know a lot of people are, uh, yeah. it's very polarizing. Sure. And so the first thing I wanted to say is that I, I think that the portal is overwhelmingly a positive thing. I think that it is, it, it is a player focused tool, I think. And it's something that gives the athletes some agency. Um, and I think advice I would give to uh, upcome people who may be considering the portal or who are using the portal now is the first thing is it is a little intimidating to put your name in it and kind of not cut your ties but like loosen where you are and kind of like push yourself into the uh, blank space or the gap between where you're going to be and where you are now that's a very scary experience and after being recruited all those years you kind of see yourself out of school no one takes the transferring process lightly uh, because you saw yourself going to that school. So it, it is tough to kind of rid yourself of where you were. Um, but to kind of alleviate the scariness for, for everyone, I think when you get uh, so nervous about going somewhere else, you kind of jump on the first opportunity and you, you don't take your time and allow the opportunities to come to you and um, like really look into your options. So when you enter the portal, you're going to get a, you get inundated really with emails and phone calls, but you can also reach out to coaches as well and look into programs as well, just like when we were being recruited to kind of um, make the best fit for yourself. And I think that that's something a lot of people forget. And it's something that I didn't realize my sophomore year was that you can go look for options as well. And they're not just going to come to you and you can, you can wait, you can, you can take your time and make the best pick for you because it is so scary and it is so, um, you feel like you're not going to get, you're a little worried that you're not going to get the opportunities you think you, you might want or the type of school that you need. And that's a scary feeling. So you jump on your first um, opportunity. And I'm just saying, if you're going into the portal and it's something that you want to do, take your time, 
understand who you are as a player and have confidence in your abilities, be your biggest advocate, take your time in making your decision and try and as hard as it is to um, understand what you want out of your next school and then make the choice that way. And find a right fit for you, right? It's got to be yeah, a right yeah. fit. Um, and that's and that's something that's easy to say, but I whenever I talk about it with people, it's understand what you value in a school, not what other people might value. When and when you have an understanding of those values, then you can properly start to assess where you could possibly go. During all of this, did it ever come to the point where you're like, I don't know if I I, I should play softball anymore? Maybe I'm it, just it's not meant to be. It's done. Did you have doubts? Yeah, absolutely. My sophomore year was probably one of the most challenging years of my life. And uh, mentally, it got to a place where I was like, I go to the field every day and I leave the locker room and I don't know why I'm here. And um, it was more negative than positive. And I found myself on the mound not wanting to be there. And I know that that's not what it looks like when I'm at the mound at UCF. And it wasn't like that my freshman year or my junior year, but my sophomore year, I I wish someone would come and take me off the mound. And once I started feeling that way, I was like, this isn't how it's supposed to be. And maybe, maybe I'm not meant to be a division one, or maybe I'm not meant to be on this field anymore. And, and it got to that point. And, you know, my parents really kind of acted as my, they kind of kept me in line and they were, they said to me like, this isn't you, this isn't how you feel. It's, I think that they, they've kind of forced me to sit down and remember who I was and remember what all the things that I did that led me to here and um, to kind of get off that that train of like, maybe I should be done to, okay, maybe there's better out there. And that was the, the shift for me sophomore year. And then obviously we move forward after ECU, got to yeah. move, you come to UCF, you land at UCF. What was that like? Because you're familiar with a lot of the players because you faced them, you, you faced them literally. Like I think you faced them four times. I want to say yeah. like 20 nearly knocked out UCF in the conference tournament in Tulsa. There was that marathon mm -hmm. game, which uh, was hilarious because we'll talk about another marathon game you had earlier this year in the postseason. But you had a marathon game against UCF that I think was a very confusing game. Went 10-11 innings. They couldn't hit you and all that. Now you're joining them. Was it? Yeah. All, but yet they, they took you in, right, as I understand it. Because that, that you said that was a big moment for you. It meant a lot to you in the fall. Yeah, well... First, initially, what Coach Bear does when she's trying to bring um, someone in is she has them do a player panel. And the point of that is she leaves and she lets the players speak honestly about what the program is like and what it means to them. And I got to speak with a couple people before I even made my decision. And that really, I knew they were trying to tell me what I wanted to hear, but a lot of them were saying, like, playing you meant this to me and playing you we want you and we we know what you can do and we want to make you better and then they were asking me questions like what do they want what do I want out of myself what do I see for our team this season because they were making sure that that was going to match with what they were trying to do as a team and that was really cool but then yeah in the fall I'm a very I know I'm very vocal and passionate on the field softball brings out my extrovert softball brings out me like speaking and being loud and being excited off the field, it takes a very long time for me to open up and to be that person that's going to make connections. And I'm a very anxious person off the field um, when it comes to new relationships and like getting to know a new team. And I have never experienced with a team this quickly, the kind of bond that we had uh, The from the first like couple practices. I was like, wow, I'm like, I'm excited to come to the field every day. I'm excited to come to lift. Uh, I literally, my cheeks would hurt from smiling and laughing so much. I wasn't a part of the conversations yet, but like just getting to hear and listen to what it was like day to day to be on this team was, it was just super special. And then eventually I got pulled into the fold and it was, it's, it quite literally is a family and we just have that trust and that bond. And uh, it was super special to be a part of. Yeah, I remember at the Georgia walk-off when Doherty hit the homer, you were pitched in relief for G, was fantastic. And I think G, as I was told, told you, hey, get used to this. We're going to win a lot of games together. You remember that? Yeah, and yeah, I do. And she actually looked at me and she said, uh, this team's got your back or we have your back. And I was, I was like, I, I believe you. I 100% believe you. I'm getting chills thinking about that moment because it was me and G together in the dugout. Like, because – when you come in from a, we had just come in off defense and, or we had just 
yeah, it, the game hadn't ended yet. Shannon was getting up to bat as we were speaking and we, we could all feel it in the air. We knew that our time was coming and we were about to, we were about to win that game. And she looked at me and we were kind of away from the hitters a little bit. And she's like, this team has your back. We're going to win a lot of games this season. And then like, we kind of looked at each other and we were excited. We looked over at the field, it goes quiet and Shannon hits the walk off. It was, you can't like write this stuff. It literally is how it happened. No. And I feel like, and you know, it's one thing to say, hey, we have this tight chemistry in the fall and this, but to do it, I feel like that Georgia game was the, really jump-started this season and maybe jump-started your year. Is that accurate, that confidence there after seeing it de delivering on the field? Absolutely, and I think what the challenge in establishing a winning culture as opposed to just a strong culture is you have to have – everybody has to believe that you can actually achieve the goals that you're looking for at the end of the year. And I mean, one win isn't going to do that, but it isn't the only thing that can do that. But like all season, all spring training and, and even in the fall, we had been preaching, we want to go to Oklahoma City. We are going to play this incredibly challenging schedule and uh, we have to prove ourselves every step of the way so that there's no doubt when we get to the end of the season that we belong there. And that's hosting a regional and whatnot. And so I mean, the hard part about developing that winning culture is that you can, we had that, we had the strong bond, we had the working hard, we had all the talent. Okay, now it's time to execute. And, and with a little bit of the magic that happened in that Georgia game, it kind of puts in your mind, okay, if we can do that, if we can upset a team on a walk-off in extra innings in the first game of season, an SEC team, um, some of the best hitters in the country, if we can do that, what's to stop us from achieving the rest of the goals this season? And I think that that really set us up, set us up with the right mindset and the right kind of competitive edge to take on everything we took on the rest of the season. And you did that and then some, you win the regular season conference title for the program first time since 15. That was at Wichita. You win the last two in Wichita to do that. And then of course you go to Greenville. It's like full circle for you because UCF, the conference took away UCF hosting the conference tournament. So they gave it to East Carolina and here you are pitching in the championship game against South Florida. What was that like for you to be back in Greenville? And now all of a sudden, you know, after we beat Houston in a dramatic game, you're pitching the championship game against the big rivals in South Florida, which is the area you're from. Uh, it was unreal. I kept having to check back in and like take a look at my feet and remember where I was just because, I mean, we always talk about not letting the moment get too big and we knew that uh, we, we, we like to take the field like we own it. And so we took possession of the field, we took ownership, and we made sure that we established dominance uh, in, in the, both of those games that we played in Greenville. But individually, it was, whew, it was interesting flying back to North Carolina and uh, like having to keep checking myself in and remember like what we were there to do because I did look around a couple of times and reminisce and just wonder how – all the paths crossed to get me to this point. So it was su super surreal. I'd say you handled it very well. Of course, the offense made it easy on you, jumping on them early, had a big lead. You pitched the shot out in the win. The thing I'll remember, there's video footage of this. The players, I think, dumped you with water or, or something, right? As they were celebrating the championship, they made it out of their way to make sure to celebrate you, which had to be special <laughs> for you that here you're, you know, we're celebrating as a team, but they, they wanted to make sure that they knew how special this was for you. Yeah. Uh, oh, you made me teary eyed. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have many words to kind of like detail to you what that was like, um, other than, I don't know. I, and I don't know how else to say it. Like, we love each other. This team love each other. And they gave me so much love as a person and a player. And I always was trying to give that back because I wanted them to know how much they meant to me and kind of like what this team and what this season meant to me and them dumping water on me and doing what they did at the end of that game, kind of like, it was, it was kind of like my fairy tale. I don't want to like take away from the team and be an individual, but the way that they like took me in and brought me into their family and I got to be a part of that. And then to celebrate me that way, when that was such an offensive win, it was such a team win. It wasn't, it really didn't have much to do with who was in the circle to celebrate that way. Um, I can, I will never ever be able to describe what that meant to me. 
as a person. Um, but I think it embodies kind of how much love this team has for each and every single person that, that played this year. So that's all I can describe it as. No, well said. Uh, trust me, you weren't the only one with teary eye that day. Um, <laughs> and for a lot of people, that'd be a heck of a way to end it, but it, it wasn't. You get, we go up 24 hours later, you're trying to find out if you're hosting, we're, we're all at a get together, not sure yeah. what's gonna happen. What was that moment like when you saw UCF there and you realized, hey, we're gonna host, we, we accomplished our goal, we set up in the fall, it was crazy. It was a couple different things. It was, I would describe it as electric. Um, it was every single, like we knew we earned it and we knew we deserved to be where we were and in the shoes that we were in because we had put, we had laid down so much work. Our coaching staff, our community and us as players, we had put so much work in to be in that moment and to see our names come up and see it come to fruition and see the stuff that we had put on the vision board in the fall months ago come come full circle and and it, it's there it's real it's happening it was it was relief it was electric it was magic it was it was every I think something that everybody needs to experience in sports at least once it was um one of the most awesome moments I've ever experienced in my life yeah it pretty for this program and everything too I mean that was uh a, a, certainly a night I'll never forget there uh, from that standpoint. So, of course, we get the regional. You're playing Villanova. We beat them. Now you're playing Michigan. Winner's bracket game. You get the ball. You go 11 innings, 181 degrees. By the way, I have the shirt. Just throw one of these. <laughs> so, there this is pretty the correct. Got the shirt, regional shirt. That thing sold out fast. It was packed. That thing, the, the regional sold out that day on Tuesday that week. It was super fast. You pitched the game, packed house. 11 innings you pitched, 181 pitches. 90 plus degree weather with an incredible atmosphere take me through what was it like to be to be doing that in that stage i mean we as a team were taking it one pitch at a time what we're really focusing on for that regional was just focusing on the opponent in front of us we stopped worrying about okay who would we play if this happens and and whatnot we started focusing on okay who's in front of us how do we beat them? How do we get to the next game? And so that's how we, and that's how I approached uh, Michigan that game. Uh, coach gave me the ball and we were, knew we were going to let the defense work as always and um, rely on our offense to get that clutch hit when we needed it. And I think, you know, early on, um, we kind of, we were a little hesitant. We were a little on our heels. And then I think third or fourth inning, we start to hit our stride defensively and pitching wise. Um, and we kind of like, we supported our offense, um, so that they could get that opportunity to get that clutch hit when we needed it. And I think we were, I, I hate to say I, because that was a full team effort. I, I just personally, I was taking it one pitch at a time, but I was able to do that because my defense was making fantastic plays behind me. They were allowing me to pitch into my plan so that I could get outs more efficiently as the pitch count started to go up and get out of innings a lot faster so that we could get our offense into hit and see more pitches and to um, hit more foul balls and get the other pitchers pitch count up. It was just, it felt like uh, the Michigan game was a very, uh, I think, good representation of all the things we do in practice coming together on the field. Excellent defense, um, a pitching into your plan and um, working together as an offense to chip across a run when the well's going dry a little bit. And I think it just shows just how much work and effort we put in all throughout season so that we could execute in the moment when it mattered most. And that's what Michigan felt like. Obviously you didn't know this at the time because you're pitching, you're playing at the time, but like social media, even in the press box, the quiet questions like, is she gonna, is they're not gonna take her out? Like they're not, they're gonna just leave her out there? Like people are worried, <laughs> like it was funny. Like people were worried about you. Like, She's going to let her go because Michigan had made all these pitching changes in contrast. And here you are, yeah. you're going, there's no action in the bullpen. But people, you know, in the inside knew that you got stronger as the game went on. And Coach Baird knew that. And you felt that way. But it was funny, like, it really became like a bigger than life story. And I think a lot of UCF, you had casual UCF fans are like, man, this girl's pitching all day. Like, <laughs> did you catch any of that feedback afterwards? Because you, I mean, you had won a lot of people over to begin with. But you won a lot of night fans that maybe weren't softball fans until that weekend just by that performance. That's awesome. I I saw a little bit of it on social media. 
Um, I, it was really cool to, to, it's really cool to always cool to make new fans and, and see people appreciating UCF softball for what it is, because I mean, our team and our energy is what allowed us to play that way that day and to get all that attention. Uh, because I mean, I wasn't alone for those 11 innings there. Ashley was there for every pitch. Uh, the, our defense was locked in for all 181. Uh, it was, I mean, it was awesome to be a part of it. And then to see that feedback of like people wanting to watch us and people getting excited to see us play, that was super cool. And I think we carried that with us into supers and carried that. And we, we've, I don't know about the feedback, but I definitely felt the support of the community um, as a night, especially um, from, from the UCF community, from people in general. And that was awesome to experience. When Maddie Bejarano get the base hit to win it, were you, obviously you're excited, but there's a part of you that's relief. Like, oh, I don't have, like how many more innings do you think you could have gone? I think, I think you can ask a lot of people this. I, when you, I, we played a lot of extra innings games this year. And I told coach Bear before I got here, the more pitches I throw, the better I do. And I kind of find myself the later in games, just getting into a, a flow or a groove. And I was in, I just felt like I was in a groove. I, I didn't, I didn't care what inning it was. I didn't care what we were doing. It was just get the next out. And when you're working three outs at a time, it doesn't, it didn't feel like that much until I finally stopped and we take our cleats off and we acknowledge what just happened. Um, I, I can't tell you how many more I could have gone, but I could have, I could have got my team a lot more outs. And I think we could have gotten a lot more outs as a team if we needed to, but you know, Maddie, Maddie came in clutch. Someone was going to come in clutch. Our offense was going to, was going to get the job done at some point. And you know, I think our defense was going to do what we needed to do to get it done. However many innings that might have been. Hey, we're just glad it went <laughs> only had to go 11. Uh, memorable game. Yeah. <laughs> Great win, Maddie, with a memorable hit. And, of course, you were the memorable performance. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we come back. I'm going to ask you about the final out to win that regional. And then I'm going to put you in charge of softball, of what you think you would, you would change about the game as far as off the field. We talked a little bit about the transfer portal. Is there anything you would change? Whether it comes to that or NIL, because you're you're pretty bright, as we'll get into here. So uh, we'll, okay. we'll come back. All right, back here with Kmo Woodall. So we talked about the Michigan win that 11 inning marathon. Mother Nature plays havoc with the schedules. Next thing, but you don't have to worry about it because you win your win away. Uh, we get to the regional final. You come in relief for Gianna. Take me through what it was like to get those last outs historic outs like it's because you knew the history you see had never won the regional and you're playing michigan carol hutchins the wolverine one of the top softball programs in the sport history and you always be remember you always be the one that got the last out the michaela michaela macario line out to her just take me through that moment as you come in relief close it out and uh make history uh well Coming in relief, so the inning before that one I came in was a lot more me. I felt, I, I came in and I was like, all right, get your job done. We got the third out that inning. And then our offense puts a bunch of runs up again. And, and then we go in with that nice big lead in the last inning. And I'll tell you what, it was, I had to rely a lot on my team that last inning because I'm not one to let the moment get too big, but the atmosphere and, and, I had, I just, I knew in my soul that we were about to win that game, that we were going to get those outs and we were going to end victorious. Um, but I had to really lean on my teammates to keep myself checked in and keep myself, you know, taking it one pitch at a time because I, I, I was so excited and so ready for that moment to just happen already. Uh, and it was really hard for me to focus on just getting one out at a time, which is usually how I, how I do my job, how I work. And so uh, I think we had one out and Shannon and a couple people on base, one out, Shannon walks over and she goes, how you doing? Uh, and like, she looked down and I always shake when I pitch, but my hand was, my hands were flying and I was like, oh, mm, I'm good. I'm good. And she was like, really? And I was like, no. <laughs> and uh, she was just like, she's like, you know, remember what you told me a couple innings ago? Cause me and Shannon kind of keep each other in check. We're both very competitive people. Uh, and sometimes we, you start thinking about things other than the task at hand, because you, you do want to win so bad and you want to give that opportunity to your team. 
And so like, I'll look at Shannon while she's out on the field standing at first. I'm like, Hey, are you having fun yet? Um, to get her to reconnect the defense and kind of just get everybody back to playing our ball. And she can, you know, she, she saw my face and she said, are you having fun yet? And I said, I'm having a great time, Shannon. And it kind of brought me back down to earth and it gave me kind of, I mean, I leaned on her. I leaned on Jada. I leaned on Lala and everybody in that defense um, and their, our dugout to kind of give me whatever I needed to, to get those final outs. Um, the first out was like, your shoulders drop a little bit. Okay. There's one. The second out was step two. I think I, I can't even remember exactly how we got it. And then I, I just remember when that last hitter stepped in the box, I was like, this is the one we're ending it right now. It's, it's the end. Um, and of course it's going to be to Lala because I have been feeding her this entire season. I had relied on her so much. Um, she's amazing. And oh watching her, I didn't even realize the ball was in her glove and I saw her run towards me with, with her glove in the air. Yeah. And, and we, I mean, me and Shannon just like screamed at each other and there were gloves flying. There were people screaming. It was. I will, I don't think I'll ever get to experience anything like that again in my, in my lifetime, but it was just pure magic. And it was, it was everything that this team had set our minds to coming together all at once. And I think we were just celebrating in that moment, all of our hard work. The whole stadium was, what was that? I mean, describe that atmosphere. Cause you had, I mean, you had football players at baseball. You had people like all over the place. It was packed baseball players, supporting football alumni was there. <laughs> I mean, alumni, yeah. Right? It was like, a, I mean, we had big crowds throughout the year. We had great support. I think we're top 21, top 22 in the country in attendance. But that was a crowd. I mean, they added more seats. And then it, it was just, I mean, what was it like to play in front of Because I heard I, it made a difference, didn't it? Oh, yeah. It was unreal. Um, shout out to our alumni because I think a lot of times you don't want to get distracted by the crowd. But hearing them supporting us and being there for us and truly being in the games with us. Uh, we looked to them a lot kind of to lead us through that and being able to come up with that win for them to kind of build off of everything they did for us was an amazing experience as well. But playing in that atmosphere was, it, you wanna enjoy it while you're in it, but it's more something that you have to look back on and remember because for we had our tunnel vision on. We were trying to play the game the way it's supposed to be played regardless of who's watching. But looking back, it was, I mean, I couldn't hear, we couldn't hear ourselves think. Uh, there was, I mean, every pitch I threw that that wasn't a strike was getting booed, regardless of where it was <laughs> yeah. in the vicinity. I think I could have thrown it backwards. And if you called it a ball, there would have been booing. It was, um, I, I can't think of another word other than like amazing, unreal. It was, it was, I think the crowd was what this team deserved. That energy and that, that like excitement for us, I think it was deserved. It was it was our community coming together to support us, and it was an amazing experience. Yeah, I mean it was packed. The Georgia game had that atmosphere. Florida had that atmosphere. But that yeah. was, you know, we didn't have the extra seats like this one, and we didn't have the alumni going crazy in the stands. I'll never forget Kira Klarkowski's leading cheers on Saturday. You play, who's the most quiet girl that I've, one of the most quiet people I've known, and here she is just losing her mind. It was just kind of surreal and. Obviously, it was in the booth, and I could hear it, like, loud. It was just uh, electric. And, you know, you've been fortunate this year because you pitched the final out on a combined no-hitter with G on senior day, which had never happened on a senior day. We're like a no-hitter, let alone a combined no-hitter with you and G, which was wild. You get the last outs on a double play on a ball hit to third where Cody throws to first against Wichita to clinch the regular season title after you pitched a masterpiece on Saturday to clinch at least to share the regular season title after a, a setback on a Friday. You win the pitch the last out to win the tournament title, and then you pitch the last out to win a regional. That's pretty good resume you built there. Yeah, and I'm just grateful that that my team and my coaches wanted to put the ball in my hand in those moments. Uh, I didn't take a second of it for granted. And, I mean, the trust that – my team had in me in those moments and the trust that I had in them was like, un inexplicable. I can't really describe what that's like, um, but it allowed us all to play free and to be like our best selves on the field in those moments. And I will, I will forever be grateful for getting to experience those moments the way that I did.
five, ten years from now, and you look back in the year, what's the first thing you'll think of? What pop? What will pop in your head? You think? There's there's a lot of memories you all made historic, but what's the first thing that'll probably pop in your brain? You think? I think uh, I think the first thing that'll pop into my head about Team Twenty One, looking back, is. Um, I don't know if I, I'm sure someone's told you the climb story. Have you what? heard the climb story? No, no, I've not. The heard story. That. Oh, well, I think a lot of people will tell you that a notable part of this season was every, before every game we had a devotional, and we'd read um, like kind of inspiring uh, writing to like kind of get us going, and then sometimes we'd read a letter from from a person on the team um, to kind of get us like in the mindset to win the game, and then we kind of started this tradition of. Uh, we would play a song that we'd listen to on the way out of the locker room or the bus to get us to send us off into the onto the field. And we did that before every game. Um, and this one particular day, if you had walked into the locker room before the devotion, we were playing all these like heartfelt, like just very like ballady songs that you, I mean, the climb by my Cyrus was the one that it ended up being, but songs like that, um, and that day, at the end of devotion, Emerson turned on the climb and kind of nobody said anything, but everybody kind of just grabbed the people next to them and we all kind of grabbed each other. And even the coaches, everybody was in there, our coaches, training staff, everybody was there. Uh, our strength coach, Coach K, and Rob Miller was there. We grabbed each other and we just started, we sang the entire song together, uh, kind of like a church thing. Instinctly. And instinct. Okay. Instantly. Yeah. And it wow. was, I cannot put into words what that moment was. I, I was bawling my eyes out because I'm a senior and I, I was like, I want this forever. Um, I want to be a part of something like this forever, but it was, it is an, it's a representation of what this team was like to be a part of um, just like singing together and being together in that moment. And I mean, I, I will remember that moment and how it made me feel for a very long time. Um, and I think that that and then going outward, all the wins on the field, the upsets, the extra innings, the training, all that stuff will come after that initial memory of M Team 21. I mean, I don't know if you know this, Eric, but a lot of us after season, we went and got Team 21 tattoos, like they got matching tattoos. Wow. To commemorate I did not season. know that. No. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. You're breaking news so, here. <laughs> yeah breaking news but yeah it was just bonding, a special though. this is a bond yeah, that goes exactly. beyond on the field right like you're, you're gonna be staying in touch with people here maybe for the rest of your life yeah. right yeah we're not faking it every time you've heard someone say it i know it sounds like old news old hat now but um it is it was a very real like bond sisterhood family whatever you want to call it and it's gonna last for a long time i think it uh ended you know, this was a historic team and it ran into another historic team in Oklahoma, which unfortunately is where the, the, the ride ended. But, you know, that Oklahoma team is being talked about as maybe the greatest softball team ever and stuff. As you've had time to reflect, do you, you gave them a good series there compared to some of the teams even in, in OKC. How, what do you what will you think about when you think of that Oklahoma Super Regional experience? Um, I mean, first of all, we were all uh, super – we, we wanted to win that series. We didn't go in thinking, um, oh, we're just happy to be here. We had intentions of going to the World Series. Um, so when I say that we got we got there and we, we soaked in every moment and we were very grateful for it, yes, we, we were happy to be there. We were so grateful. It was an amazing experience. But we did not for one second take ourselves out of that competition. Um, we, it was, it's two games. We, we said if, if there's anyone in this country who's going to win two, who could possibly win two games, it's going to be us. And we're going to fight like heck to try and do it. So that was our mindset going in and being there and embracing the moment and trying to, you know, um, figure out a way to chip, scratch runs across and, and hold their offense off. But I mean, I don't think anyone can deny that that was a, that team is a powerhouse and I've never, um, I've never pitched against any kind of offense like that. It was very unique in that, um, I mean, when you come to this level in college, what a lot of coaches and a lot of people will say is that you cannot rest one through nine when you're pitching to a lineup because every single person is the best from where they came from. 
And I have never seen such an example of that um, offensively than with Oklahoma. Um, they threatened power, speed, and um, just execution with every single batter that stepped up to the box. Um, and every ball had the potential to either leave the field or find a gap. So it was, um, it was a challenge. And I think uh, our team learned a lot from it. And um, going forward, teams in the future, Team 22 and onward, are going to take that with them and play with that chip and use that to be even better next season. So. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and now Jocelyn Allo, for example, is going to be teammates with Gianna in the pros. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I spoke with G last week. She was hoping that she would be teammates with her. So, and uh, pick her brain a little bit. It's like, what the, what, what? What, what could I have done differently? <laughs> like, basically, was what she was referring. So what is next for you now? Um, so I will be attending Baylor Law School in the fall. Uh, and that's going to be for three years. And then I hope to take the bar exam and start practicing. What got you interested in that? Um, wow. That's a, to make it a short story, uh, I have been around a lot of, I got to experience a lot of things when I was uh, growing up and I saw a lot of injustices and a lot of things that I feel really passionate about, um, like being a part of and fixing. So that got my passion for like law and the legal system going. I studied psychology in college and I started looking at um, crime and behavior from a psychological standpoint. And I got really interested in that. Um, and then, you know, I, um, I, I, just, I had to decide, do I want to come at it from a psychological scientific angle or do I want to come at it from a legal angle? And I realized that um, like logic and law and reform were really what my passions were. And so that's kind of what pushed me into the legal profession and like what I hope to do moving forward. That's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah. That's not the, that's pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how that goes for you over there in Baylor and you might be getting like text messages, you know, about a year or two when UCF's in the Big Twelve. Of you know, hey, what what do we go for wait in, to to eat or whatever in Waco? You might be, you might <laughs> I'll be like, definitely. Uh, yeah, you might be the, exp I'll the expert. I'll definitely be at games. <laughs> I definitely plan on being at some games. Nice. So. Uh, yeah. Did you have a player looking at a uh, look you looked up to as you were getting into softball? A player that I looked up to. Um. Early on for me, it was Kat Osterman because she had my birthday. I really loved lefties for some reason. Yeah. So I really loved lefties because the next person that I really remember just watching and being in awe of was Kaylani Ricketts. And I loved her demeanor and I loved that she hit and pitched. And I just really, I focused on her um, in my recruiting because that was, she was really in influential around the time that I was like, okay, I want to go to college, play softball. And so I really looked to her for how to dominate opponents and what kind of tools to have in my tool belt. Looked at her a lot. Um, I mean, Paige Parker as well. Paige Parker was a little bit later and I love, I ended up being Oklahoma pitchers a lot. Um, but Kaylani and uh, Paige were really influential for me and Taryn Alvello. I loved watching Taryn Alvello. She really, she, her screwball was something that I looked up to and her demeanor and her passion on the field were uh, awesome to watch. And uh, she was just a player that she, she looked like me on the field. She looked like someone that I could be. And I, I really loved watching her as well. So those were the kind of people that I liked to watch as a child. It's a pretty good list. Pretty good list. We talked earlier about your experience with the transfer portal the two times and the advice you would give players. If I put you in charge of repping the players in softball and there's something you think that needs to be addressed on the field, off the field, could be the portal, could be anything you want. What would you, what would you, uh, where were you, where were you look at? Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, it's a good question. I served on SAC for, for ECU and I got, I was, kind of mentored by um, a SAC representative. She's actually the SAC president um, and a representative for the ACC at NC State. So um, I, do, I do think a lot about like what athletes need advocated more for them. Um, I think systemically, I think we saw this a lot this year, um, mental health in student athletes needs to be something that I think uh, is addressed more. 
the the competitive nature of division one sports and actually collegiate sports in general not just division one um top to bottom is very cutthroat very competitive and i think for a long time it was expected that athletes kind of coped with it um however and kind of did it themselves and when you have high performing elite uh athletes um only ever getting pressure and um and kind of discipline um hit into uh, forced into them. We're already, you know, the type of people that are going to try and excel the best we can in the field that we're in. And so I think what a lot, what needs to change and be reformed, I think is, um, having staff and having, um, open conversations with athletes before, during, and after their college experience, um, of athletics, just because, um, right now the way that it is, is, uh, if you need help, you can go and, and go seek it. And there are usually um, awesome sports psychologists on staff ready to help. But what I think is that a lot of people don't know going in what it's going to be like, and they don't really know how to cope believing as well. And then during, there's so many obstacles and challenges unique to the individual that you're going to face because you are a high level athlete that you can't go to your coaches or your peers or your professors for. It's something unique to that athletic experience. And I think that not only having it available, but um, making it a point to be a part of an athlete's schedule um, and making it a point to be something that they do just as much as they do there. We do entrance physicals every year. Um, and when you transfer as well, to make sure that your body is um, able to perform and make sure that we're not missing anything physically. And I think that that should be happening mentally as well. Um, I'm not as educated on the NIL stuff or the transfer portal. I have my opinions on the transfer portal, but if I was going to advocate for anything for athletes, um, based on my experience, it would be the mental health aspect and kind of, um, there's already this cutthroat nature of, uh, of collegiate athletics. There needs to be something there to, to bring you back down and to, um, make sure that the rest of your life surrounding the sport is healthy and positive so no that's, well that's said. my take that's well said i mean obviously mental health was forefront this year obviously with the tragedy at jmu and uh elsewhere in other sports as well not just softball i mean this is beyond softball i think with mental health and right i think we're learning more and more about hey you know there's a lot of highs and lows for a student athlete uh yeah on the field off the field you're trying to figure out who you are as a person um, and I think there's a support group there. I think that's, I think that's kind of been learned this year. And I hope uh, we kind of address that, like you mentioned, uh, moving forward, uh, from that standpoint and help the communication part. Right. Cause a lot of that too is, you know, you know, it's kind of like making sure everybody's doing okay. Hey, are you okay? Whereas, cause otherwise, cause athletes always sometimes are their own worst enemy, right? Cause they'll keep things to themselves. Is that right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. And you, I think with athletes specifically, a lot of us don't even realize that it's not okay. Um, I remember when I was a sophomore and I was going through what I was going through, I just assumed I was the problem. I assumed that I was weak and that I couldn't handle uh, whatever was being thrown at me and that I just simply needed to be stronger. And I think that that's how a lot of athletes take it. And a lot of athletes simply, and I think even ones that have retired or who have moved on to different leagues or whatever, didn't realize that we handled it wrong or that we, we didn't realize what we were going through wasn't okay. And that you can, um, and you can acknowledge when you're not feeling okay and still be a strong warrior, passionate athlete, um, that can push through adversity and stuff like that. So it's a hard balance to strike. I do understand that because we do want to push through and be able to overcome obstacles, but on the same hand, um, you need to know that you're supported through those obstacles and that, your sport doesn't define who you are um, and doesn't encompass you as a person. And I think that's pretty tough. So last uh, thing. Yeah. It's a, it's a challenge there. Last thing or two, how did, how have you changed in, in your one year in UCF? How are you different today than you were say maybe one year ago? Um, UCF taking me in the way that they did and allowing me to play the way that I could. Um, they made me, they made me more confident in showing my passion. Um, they made me, uh, they gave me a voice as a leader um, in a different way than I've ever experienced. So I'm much more vocal and I'm much more comfortable displaying how excited I am about things, uh, whether it be softball or whether it be something else. They basically gave me a voice um, 
And I'm a lot more confident than I was in that voice. And I'm a lot more sure in uh, the decisions I make and the things I do and the things I say because of how they took me in and, and the way that they lifted me up as a person and as an athlete. So I definitely would say that they've made me a better leader. They've made me a better person. Um, UCF definitely has just made me um, all around, like it gave me the last push I needed to be um, a woman like moving on into the world. So. Well, you made UCF softball and UCF in general better. Uh, it's been <laughs> awesome to get to know you and obviously cover you for the year. I've called you the Mike Hughes of UCF softball. I don't know if I ever, did I ever fully explain to you what that means. Like, because you may not know. No. All, right. All right. So I, Mike Hughes was his defensive back who transferred out of North Carolina to UCF. Literally came in at the last minute prior to the 2017 season. I think he transferred like in July, August range. I, I don't remember the dates. Joined the team, and it was like that perfect fit, that last piece of the puzzle. Was an awesome cornerback, was an All-American, great kick return, made one of the most biggest famous plays in UCF football history with a kickoff return for a touchdown to beat South Florida in this wild game on Black Friday. Helped them win the conference title, and they won, you know, went undefeated that year. And everybody you asked on that football team said they wouldn't do it. None of that would happen without Mike Hughes. If Mike Hughes wasn't a part of that team, we just would be missing that piece. We wouldn't be the same. I think it's the same as applied to you. I don't think UCF, I think every player would agree and coach would agree. All the accomplishments this year doesn't happen if you didn't come to UCF because you're yeah. a big part of the piece of the puzzle. You're that last piece of the puzzle that had to be added in there. So uh, you deserve that. That's, a, so that's the highest honor you can get. And uh, <laughs> But uh, thank you for doing this, being so open on so many topics. I, I wanted to do this for you after the year because, like I said, I could, in getting to know you, I know you've got a lot of topics and you're pretty smart. Uh, and you've had a you have a great story thank to you. tell. So, thanks for doing this. We'll be in touch, and uh, uh, appreciate you coming on. I appreciate that. Thank you.